Rainy. We are very happy to uh, have this program with uh, Miranda Burnett and Addie Addison Patrick and Sterling Howe and talking a little bit about the uh, magazine article that's going to be upcoming in the ne next magazine. Um, all about the history or a little bit more detailed history about the hundred years of the public library system in Albemarle County and Charlottesville um, and in a wide multi-county radius around us. Um, so yeah, we still have a few more people, so we'll give a little more time for people to join us. Everyone out there trying to finish up their dinner before they join us. Um, that's fine if you are still eating, you can just keep your video off, it's all good. Well, we're about a minute out, so I think I'll get started with the official part of this, even though it is unregulated. Um, as we let more people log in, I'd like to welcome everyone. You can leave your comments in the Zoom chat and Facebook comments for those out in Facebook land. Um, or you can email us at programs at albemarlehistory.org. Uh, send us any questions you would like us to address during the show. Um, and you can send us any suggestions you have for future shows. Um, a few announcements before we get started. On Tuesday, April 5th at 7 p.m., uh, we are going to have a special program featuring participants in our ongoing oral history project race and sports, um, athletics amid desegregation in Central Virginia. Uh, program is coming together basically kind of as we speak over the next week, and we're excited to present this to the local community, the work that we're doing on this pretty cool project. Um, in the meantime, you can check out what we uh, put out there in November with uh, AARP um, on a program that we did on this project. Um, it's on our web website, actually, right on our homepage. You can click right there and link into the uh, YouTube video. So hold the date for April 5th, and we will be sending out more information as we uh, have it available. On Tuesday, April 12th at 7 p.m., the Historical Society is working with the City of Charlottesville's Historic Resource Committee, uh, the Jefferson Madison Regional Library, and Preservation Piedmont uh, to bring Dr. Ann Bailey to Charlottesville. Uh, the title of her talk is Remembering the Victims of Slave Auctions, The Healing of Charlottesville and a New Way Forward. Uh, the program will be a hybrid event, so it'll be in-person participation at the Swanson Meeting Room at the JMRL Central Downtown Branch, and will also be live streamed on Facebook. So look for more information coming out on the JMRL uh, calendar page um, for April 12th. Um, with the Historical Society on Thursday, April 14th at 7 p.m., Regina Rush will tell us about the rushes of Chestnut Grove, one family's journey from slavery to freedom. Uh, Miss Rush is the recipient of the 1857 Memorial Essay Award for her article included in our 2018 and 2019 double volume magazine. Um, and it will be uh, an online program you can ac access by Zoom or Facebook. And speaking of our magazine, it is going to the printers very, very soon. It will be within the next week, it will be heading to the printers. And so keep an eye out for these to be arriving in your mailbox sometime in April. Uh, hopefully, uh, if the mail service gets it there promptly, but we'll see. Um, between April 15th and May 15th, the Historical Society will have the Hampton History Museum's traveling exhibit, When Computers Wore Skirts, NASA's Human Computers. Uh, so come by uh, 200 Second Street Northeast and see it from April 15th to approximately April 30th. And then in May, uh, for the remaining portion of when we have that exhibit, it will be shared with uh, Westminster Canterbury of the Blue Ridge. Um, and we have a number of other programs coming up in May also, so keep an eye out. We'll be putting more information out there. Um, one of them that's pretty cool is on May 26th for Memorial Day, 
we'll be speaking with uh, a Debbie Holloman and a Sebastian Vonk um, about the work of the Fields of Honor Foundation, uh, which honors the service and sacrifice of World War II service members buried or memorialized at war cemeteries in Belgium, France, Luxembourg, and the Netherlands. Um, the idea for this program came about when Debbie reached out to us to help find photographs of uh, Private Clarence McCauley and our very own Miranda Burnett helped to make a connection so that uh, we could find a picture uh, of this uh, World War II vet who was buried in the cemetery from one of his family members lived in North Carolina. So now you can go to that website and see um, that gentleman where before it was just a blank space. So very happy to have participated in that and we're very honored to have them come out and help us with a Memorial Day program in May. Also on your calendars, Mark, in July and August, so basically from July 1st through the end of August, we will have Francis Brand's first portraits um, over at the center at Belvedere. Uh, we're still working out the details. We're gonna be pulling all that together. And, uh, but mark your calendars for that. We'll have an opening reception and a couple other programs surrounding that. So we're very excited to bring these firsts back. They haven't been on view for many years. So looking forward to that. And I think that's enough with the announcements. So let's make some history. I'm Tom Chapman here with Sterling Howe of the Albemarle Charlottesville Historical Society, and we'd like to welcome you to Unregulated Historical Meanderings, the last word on the library centennial, maybe, edition. Um, this is our 12th meandering in which we invite some person or persons to join us and have a conversation about things of interest to our friends out there in Charlottesville, Albemarle area and beyond. Today, we are proud to welcome Addison Patrick and Miranda Burnett. Addison Patrick is the library coordinator at the University of Virginia Law Library and volunteer extraordinaire at the Albemarle Charlottesville Historical Society. She graduated from the University of Virginia in 2020 with a BA in Anthropology and French. And Miranda Burnett is the historical collection librarian for the Jefferson Madison Regional Library. She is also the co-founder of the Take Them In Families project, which traces the descendants of the enslaved families President James Monroe sold to Florida. And today with this program, we're changing it up a bit and that's how we do things when we're unregulated. So bear with us, but I'm gonna put Sterling in the guest seat and I'm gonna take a step back and Miranda will take the leading role in asking Sterling and Addison about the article that will appear in the upcoming 79th volume of our magazine. And this will bring an end to our year-long exploration of the 100-year history of the local library system. So with that said, take it away, Miranda. All right, well, thank you, Tom. And welcome everyone to this evening's 12th Unregulated Historical Meanderings. So 101 years ago, the Charlottesville Public Library opened its doors to our community. And to celebrate the centennial, the Jefferson Madison Regional Library partnered with Albemarle Charlottesville Historical Society to tell the story of the library. In the past few months, this has included a new exhibit up on the third floor of Central Library, the premiere of the film, Free and Open to the Public by the talented local filmmaker, Lorenzo Dickerson, and now a soon to be published article in the forthcoming issue of the magazine of Almarle Charlottesville History. And so this evening's conversation is with two of the article's authors, Sterling and Addie, who will give us a more detailed glimpse into this hundred year old story. So Sterling, I'm gonna put you in the hot seat first. Oh boy. Tell us about the origins of the article. Okay, well, uh, as memory serves, I was brand new to the Historical Society, had just started back in uh, August 2020, and Tom comes and tells me about these conversations he was having with David Plunkett at JMRL. So it's going to be the 100-year anniversary of the library, and they want an exhibit. So Tom says, okay, make it happen. And I'm like, what? I just, I don't even know I don't know what's going on around me, but okay, sure. We'll, um, we'll make this exhibit happen. So uh, 
I turned to you at first, Miranda. I was like, all right, you got to help me out with this. It's like, just give me everything you got. So you just stacked my desk up with all these folders and pointed me to the online um, board minutes of, of the library. And we got going. And then something I've, Tom said something to me that I think this was the first time he said it, but it's he's probably said it about a thousand times since then. So let's kill as many birds with one stone as we can. It's like, we're in need of a, of a article for uh, the, for the next, the next Mac, the next magazine. So if you're doing all this research. Can't you just turn that into an article too? Like, yeah, sure. On top of everything else you've given me to do, I can write a 25 page uh, academic article. Yeah, no problem. Uh, so I quickly realized, no, I could not do that. I, I needed some help. Hey, I'm the volunteer coordinator here. Let me see if I can find some good volunteers to help. And so that's what I did. And now months later, we have an article about to come out. So Addie, is that really how you got involved in this project? <laughs> uh, yeah, I mean, that's, that's essentially the short end of it. I think um, Sterling asked me if I could look over some early drafts of the exhibit as well. Um, I had just started volunteering not that long ago when I did that, so that was cool. And, um, and then from there, since I already had a little bit of a familiarity, I suppose, with the history from reading over those panels, um, he asked me if I wanted to help and I said, no. I said, yeah. So um, yeah, and then um, I should shout out Ellen Blackman too, who is our third author. Um, and I believe she was approached in a similar fashion. And of course she said yes. And then we formed our fabulous trio, so. That was gonna be my next question because I know Ellen wasn't able to join us this evening, but how, how did you branch out to bring three different authors on board um, to write an article? Um, what, I guess, Sterling, what is the general process for publishing in the magazine? Well, I would, um, I asked Carrie about that, who's uh, our editor, the editor of the Mac. It's like, because of course this is my first experience with it. So I was like, you know, is this normal? And uh, no, it's not normal. Nothing about the last few years has been normal as everyone knows, but in a typical year, um, the magazine publication schedule spans roughly from April to October. Um, uh, the historical study takes in submissions on a rolling basis, but we have a publications committee that reviews all the submissions and recommends uh, selections for publication. And that usually happens between January and March. Um, then Carrie, the editor, um, contacts the authors, to notify them uh, that they've been accepted or rejected, um, their submissions have or have not. Um, and then the selected articles, the editor sets out a biweekly schedule for exchanging drafts um, with approximately uh, four rounds of revisions at each stage to you know, get some more and more polished until we and get illustrations and captions until it's ready to go to the graphic designer for layout and then, to, um, and then out to be printed. But yeah, nothing about the last few years has been, uh, been normal. As um, Tom alluded to earlier, uh, we put out uh, two uh, volumes of the magazine at once. And that was because we had a couple of years where it wasn't published. And now with this uh, upcoming um, uh, volume that was done all during the pandemic, and because we were short on submissions, we had this idea to do one about the library history since we were already doing the research for the exhibit. And as I said, I did not feel I could do it by myself, but guess what? I knew these two brilliant people who could help me out, uh, Addison and, and Ellen. Um, so we're not on the normal schedule, but as Tom said, we are just about to go to printing uh, very, very soon. So I'm hearing the, this whole process of you know, a bi-weekly schedule, which sounds very intimidating, um, I remember when I published an article two years ago, like I sent it off to the quarterly. This is a Florida historical quarterly. And next thing I know, five months later, hey, we're going to publish it. And here's a draft. And like, that was it. Um, so this seems to be a very intensive process that you guys are going through. Um, Addie, what is it like to like research and write and, and publish an article? What, what is your process? 
So this is uh, the first article, that I guess, that I've published outside. Of, well, I haven't published anything when I was a student, but, you know, I wrote articles as a student and everything. Um, I think my sort of general takeaway from working on this article is that it truly, truly, truly takes a village of scholars, at both past and present, and also institutions to write anything about Charlottesville local history. Um, the Albemarle Charlottesville Historical Society has a vast collection of all sorts of things, and um, the University of Virginia has a ton of other things, and then JMRL has, you know, the board minutes that are digitized and available online for everybody. So the first part of the process was like, sort of similarly to Sterling, sort of seeing what we had in order to determine, okay, what are we going to write about? What does the archive tell us? So um, Sterling and you had started that work with the exhibit and, and bringing these JMRL board minutes to the fore. And then of course, in our pamphlet and manuscript collection here at ACHS, we have a large bulk of um, Paul Goodloe McIntyre material, library material, the um, Friends of the Friends of JMRL newsletter. We have a pretty expansive collection of that here at ACHS. Um, and then of course, the MAC has published a couple articles about um, the McIntyre building. So there were previous publications that we could consult. And then, um, then I found out that randomly the um, Albert and Shirley Small Special Collections has the catalog, the first catalog for the Charlottesville Public Library is, is there. And so, um, and that's maybe we'll get into a little bit later, but um, so yes, it was, it was gathering all of this material and then, um, and then we, we needed to have a meeting about how are we going to write an article with three authors? Is it going to be one article where we like edit it for each other's voices? And, and that was, you know, I thought from the outset going to be a difficult and maybe not so fruitful venture trying to edit each other's writing voices in different ways. And, and we all had, you know, different scholarly backgrounds and different ways of writing. So, and there was so much to say. So we thought maybe we should break it up a little bit more thematically as opposed to chronologically um, and talk about, you know, access, knowledge and technology um, and split it up so that each author, you know, could take their own sort of approach, um, interpreting all of the material that we had in their own way, in their own writing voice, voice to, to tell these three thematic chapters of the library's history. So how did you decide who wrote what? Because the article has the three different themes of it. Who did you draw straws for it? What, how, did you, how did you determine it? Um, you, no, you can go ahead. Okay. Um, we, you know, just kind of put it out there. Um, we, well, I think we first started with, or there was a previous magazine article about uh, the history of libraries mm -hmm. in, uh, in the county. It carried up to a certain point, and like and and so we we knew we didn't want to repeat, you know, the same information that's been written about before, but at the same time we have a hundred years of history to cover, so you know we couldn't couldn't say everything there was to say. Um, we had to narrow it down. We decided we didn't want to try to do a strict uh, chronology. Um, we wanted to give each person their own uh, angle. Um, so over a couple of conversations, we were, you know, thinking about themes, um, thinking about like, what is it we're really talking about? It, and it was really important back, going back to the exhibit, it was really important um, to David Plunkett and Jay Morrell to really address uh, the library's history uh, during uh, the segregation era. And in thinking, and, but in and thinking about we wanted to tell a hundred years of history up to today, we realized that um, technology was gonna be a big part of that too. So we arrived at kind of a driving theme of access and how the concept of access has changed over time. And then, and then we realized um, that that has different meanings. And uh, I basically turned to you know, Addison and Ellen asked them what, what interests them. And Addie immediately gravitated towards uh, the the early period of the history and the and the issues of of uh, racial segregation and how the uh, the library first started to take a regional shape and what that meant. Um, I'm more of a, 
uh, history of ideas kind of person. So I latched immediately on to um, what was actually in the library, the books, what was what was what, what was shelved, what was what was um, circulated, and what wasn't, and why. And uh, Ellen uh, kind of took the bullet and really uh, took the really complicated uh, technological um, theme and ran with it. That's kind of how that um, played out to my memory. Does that sound right, Addy? Yeah, and I will add um, for Ellen's piece the the interesting challenge there was, of course, she's taking on sort of this later this later chapter of the library's history. Um, we expand the definition of technology to include, you know, vinyl records and that sort of thing, like things aside from books. Um, but she actually got to do a number of oral history interviews to um, with, of course, people that are still living and lived through this history, you know, this 80s history and into the present. So that was an added element of our research. Um, mm -hmm. so it wasn't just archival. Yeah. So you've mentioned it twice already, the early collection. What are what were some of those early books that were in the public library? Well, <clears throat> it was uh, just imagine classical literature. And, I imagine not too much fiction in there. <laughs> uh, some, but um, some, but again, it uh, of the um, uh, classical, you know, hmm. fiction. Not, not nothing that was very, not much that was contemporary to the time. Um, there, as uh, Addie was saying, the catalog is out there and can be looked at, the entire list of 5,000 books. Uh, I find the introduction to the catalog very interesting and actually it's a little bit of it's quoted in the article. Um, but yeah, there was uh, a lot of thought uh, and, uh, and a little bit of trepidation was put into choosing that initial uh, 5,000 book collection. Yeah, I will add. Um, so it's the the catalog is not online. I've digitized. I took pictures of it, but it's in like a Google Drive folder. So if you really want to see it, I can share it with you. Um, but it's it's you know the physical copies and small special collections. But um, it's it's super fascinating because the guy who wrote the introduction, John S. Patton, was the was a UVA librarian. Um, and you guys will I won't spoil too much about what's in the article, but at the time, you know, in 1919 these sort of men of ideas had had thoughts about what the library should hold. And so um, the catalog reflects that. I should also mention that the cataloger who's who's credited in the, as compiling the catalog um, was a woman, Ellen Watson Johnson, who um, also worked for the university. Um, we'll talk about we're going to I know we're going to talk about that <laughs> later. So I just I'm just mentioning that. But um, but yeah, I think I was I was looking through it, too looking through it while we were working on this article and thinking about like, I don't know, I guess I was expecting these shocking things to stand out. Like what, what did the first catalog have? Like probably these crazy racist books, which I'm sure there were some, but you know, they had like the Bible, you know, Chaucer, I think Shakespeare. Um, they had a small section for children's books. Um, so they did have children's literature, but, um, and again, you'll read this in the article, but um, when Richard Thomas Walker Duke Jr. gives his speech at the laying of the cornerstone of the uh, first public of uh, the first library building, um, it's very clear that like there's this conversation going on in the early 1900s about what books people should be reading and like they shouldn't be reading romance novels and like some elements of literature are you know for women and there's the right you know the the right things that people should be reading. And so they were very, very particular in putting together this first collection. Was there anything you found in the research that um, I guess surprised you um, kind of maybe, or maybe even shocked you? That, you know, something you found that you kind of couldn't get out of your head after you read it? Sterling, do you want to go first? Sure. Um... <laughs> I know I'm not sticking to the script, but that's why it's unregulated. <laughs> For me, it was um, the uh, the amount of public outcry during the 1950s to get to to censor certain books, and particularly to get to get out get out of the library any books that referenced 
socialism, communism, the Soviet Union. This was the middle of the, you know, the Cold War. And, you know, McCarthyism is affecting the country. And there was, you can see even in little Charlottesville, there was this strong belief that there was this, you know, Soviet socialist ins ins insurgency um, uh, are surrounding us, going to brainwash us. And we just couldn't have any books, even on, you know, uh, the history of Russia that anyone could, could look at because it might corrupt them. And just, you know, look, and, and I found that uh, interesting, uh, a little bit scary, and I'll, and given everything that's going on right now, can't stop thinking about it. Yeah, I, I think for me, I, I guess my understanding of, I, okay, I guess I was most shocked by the amount of activism that was happening in the 1940s to integrate and better, um, better the services at the 4th Street branch, which was the Black Library that was at Jefferson School prior to the Charlottesville Public Library integrating in 1948. Um, I think my understanding of Charlottesville history prior to the article was sort of, is always informed by me being a University of Virginia student. So I feel like I've got UVA's history down, like, and then, so I know a little bit about like the 18, late 1800s, and then I'm like, okay, there's activism happening in the 1960s with the civil rights movement and massive resistance and integration of the Charlottesville um, public school system. But um, I was I was shocked and I don't know, maybe not shocked, shocked might not be the right word, but I was surprised reading through the general board minutes of these very like piecemeal pushes that Benjamin Bunn, um, who was, a reverend and a founder of the NAACP in Charlottesville. Um, he, he and his colleagues were really pushing piece by piece to try and get the services at the 4th Street branch to be somewhat equitable to what the Charlottesville Public Library had by like, we wanna have newspapers at our library. We'd like to have a phone please at our library. Like these type of things, we'd like to have evening hours. And um, again, you'll read in the article sort of how once the library integrates in 1948, it isn't quite, you know, happy-go-lucky as you might hope it would be. Um, but these these little advances that were happening in the 1940s, sort of 1940s Charlottesville history was unfamiliar to me really um, until working on this. So Sterling, what's next? Well, <clears throat> as we mentioned earlier, we're about to go to printing. So now we're already thinking about the next volume of the magazine. Um, so I would like to put out a call to everyone. Um, if, uh, if you are interested in writing an article, you have a manuscript handy, um, whether you have, um, you know, if, if you would like to, get published and see your work in the magazine of album martial arts history um you should please email carrie matthews our editor and uh, that email is editor m-a-c-h at albemarlhistory.org um, tom can put that in the chat if you would please um uh, and uh, inquire about uh inquire about publishing your article uh with carrie um, the research, uh, the guidelines for any contributors can be found in any recent copy of the magazine. And you can also see that on our website. Um, uh, and this includes the style requirements for endnotes and illustrations. Um, as we've already discussed, the uh, editing process is highly collaborative uh, between author and editor. So a willingness to have your work edited is essential. Uh, but both uh, first time and season authors are welcome. Uh, we're always looking for new and exciting topics to feature in the magazine. So please send us what you got. Good to know. And as far as the library goes, I would say we should probably wait another hundred years and see what happens. But, but in the meantime, uh, go take advantage of your local public library. Yes, very much so. Um... And every librarian at JMRL is fantastic. There is no such thing as a stupid question. We answer everything. So do come to the library. Um, use all of our resources there. One question for both of you guys. What are some of your takeaways from 
uh, from the history of the library system. I mean, if this is your final word, the last thing you have to say um, before we put to rest the history of the library for the next hundred years, what would both of you say? Go ahead, Addie. <laughs> um, I feel like, so Miranda, I feel like what you, your plug that you just get, gave about going to the public library just sort of speaks to my takeaway of this, which was like I mentioned in the early 1900s, um, these sort of wealthy white men had these ideas about what the library should be and how the library should really be an edu like an, an educator to the public. And they really curated their collection to have the books that they thought that the public should read, um, the white public at this time in Charlottesville. Um, but really in the 50s, 60s, 70s, you start to see a major, major shift in libraries where now libraries and librarians are more so catering to what the public wants. And Jay Morrell really does an excellent job of that. I have to also plug, you guys should all get like public library cards, whether you're in Albemarle County or not. Um, because now generally public libraries are, and academic libraries as well, because I work in one, are you know more so servants to the public. And so um, I guess, I don't know what that takeaway means. Like I'm a fangirl of libraries, I don't know. But, um, but just the, yeah, the, the development of them and librarians as, as servants and how it wasn't always like that. So be kind to your librarians, but utilize them um, because libraries have more than just like archival, you know, books. There are a lot more services that they provide um, and they probably don't get paid enough to provide them, but yeah. <laughs> Uh, yeah, I would just add to that. There's definitely a lot more going on in the library than, than books. It is, uh, the library is definitely a, an important piece of uh, social infrastructure, provides lots of services uh, um, uh, for the community. Um, my big takeaway though, I think is what, um, what a, a cultural battleground library can be and has been and that um, when I first started this project, I was kind of thinking, oh my God, this is going to be so boring. I'm researching a library, really? But no, but it's been such a dynamic institution. And I, I think, and then, I mean, putting it in more kind of philosophical terms, um, thinking about the way the community has, um, the community influence has shaped the information that the library provides it library is in, in some way an embodiment of the community's mind and a reflection of its character and thus the changes of the library over time are reflections of changes of that character. So as such, the library is a, tremendous, is a tremendously useful lens through which to look at our community's history and understand what, what we've gone through and how we got to where we are. So I, 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 I would say, Keep an eye on the library. It's a fascinating place. But uh, I have, uh, but I have one last thing. And actually, I want to turn the tables once more, and actually ask you two, Miranda and Addie, a question. It occurred to me that I'm sitting here talking to two uh, female library professionals, and it's Women's History Month. So I would be remiss if I did not ask, um, what's what's your two's takes on um, be it a reality or a, uh, or a, um, a stereotype about librarianship as a feminine profession. And uh, following that, what has, what has the library profession meant to women in local and uh, national history and how, have, and how have women, do you think, changed libraries? You want to go for that first, Addie? Um, I I can maybe answer some um, of, the, <laughs> of the questions. So um, I suppose you know librarianship historically has followed um, really the sort of the profession of teaching, and that it it was very initially male, and then has sort of become certainly public teaching has become known as this feminine profession. Um, there are articles which Miranda has shared with me that talk about librarian, how, 
how the feminization of librarianship has affected salaries, et cetera, which you guys could read if you wanted to. Um, and I don't, I mean, I don't know if, I don't know where the stereotype of the shushing librarian comes from, like the old lady shushing librarian with the horn rim glasses, I guess like from TV and movies and and I don't know, like public Brandish librarian. Brandon shushes me all the time, let me tell you. That is the entire reason I lift weights is so I can keep my arms in shape so I can shush people. <laughs> there you go. Um, so, I don't know. I may need to think a little bit more and pass the baton to Miranda if I before I have any large, grand thoughts about women and librarianship. Well, how it became so feminized in the first place um, is you know, the end of the 19th century. You have, of course, they're educated white women. Um, they need something to do and. Uh, libraries see them as a, um, a um, low pay solution to, to staffing a library. Um, for some of the other articles I read, Addie, you mentioned the first cataloger who put together that list of 5,000 books being a woman. Um, some of the very um, sexist stereotypes about women as librarians or just in, in a library in the first place is that we have the patience to do these repetitive tasks such as cataloging and, and so forth. Um, I don't know if that's quite true. I don't have the patience for that at all. Um, but that's how it really started was because we could be paid less than men uh, to do, you know, three of us could do the job of one man and they could pay us still less than that, what they would pay that one man. Um, and so that's, that's really how it began. Um, librarianship today, I think it's the stat is like 80% women still. Um, and what's really surprising to me, and I know it's changed, especially over the last 20 years, um, we're still 81% white. Um, I think it's like 7% of librarians are black. I think 6% are Hispanic. Um, a lot of that is because of barriers to even become um, a librarian. I mean, Addie, as you know, you're about to go to library school. Um, you have to have a master's degree to go to library school. So who are you, who, what, what, what's the social class of people who are going to be pursuing those advanced degrees just to become a librarian in the first place? Um, in terms of stereotypes, we have to share two of my favorite movies. So the first one's Ghostbusters, that very opening scene when they're in the library, you have the shushing ghost. Um, I love, that's like, I could not watch the rest of the movie and just only see that scene. Um, but I wanna be the shushing ghost librarian when I pass on, <laughs> that's the, the, the dream for me. Um, but then the other movie, of course we watch it every year. It's, it's a wonderful life with the, the shimmering Donna Reed, um, as a friend of blessed memory used to say. But there's the scene where, you know, the, he, he goes back to see what happens to the town if he had never existed. And you have Donna Reed coming out of the library as that mousy, you know, wearing glasses, the hair pulled back in the low bun, um, kind of meek type stereotype. Um, so I think of, of librarian stereotypes pretty often. And, and knowing my colleagues and, and seeing how some of us kind of want to um, embody some of the different stereotypes and then others try to buck those trends and, and do our own thing. Very interesting. <laughs> uh, Addie, did you think of anything else to add? Um, I, I just had some thoughts. I don't know if there are any conclusions, but... Um, you know, I, the other thing that comes up in, in these conversations about, you know, women in the early days in the early 1900s and, and on through the 50s or whatever, as as having these lower paying administrative at librarian roles. And then, of course, the director is always a man. And um, similarly to like public schools having female teachers and then the principal is a man, you, you see this thing. Um, I, I don't know of any like statistics about whether or not that has changed. I like want to assume that it has. Um, there is. Um, oh, I'll, I'll just send you the source later. Um, I think the study was done back in 2012, which all of a sudden I realized like a decade ago now. 
Um, but it had um, what, what the, the genders of library directors and they were overwhelmingly female. The pay was still less, but overwhelmingly female. Well, I learned one of my colleagues um, informed me that we have a librarian of Congress, which maybe I should have known this, but this is a Thomas, like started with Thomas Jefferson, like a presidential appointed position. And so our librarian of Congress is a woman. Um, yes. So yeah. I don't know, girl power, I guess. But yeah, <laughs> that obviously like a face that faces other things that the library profession now, I mean, diversity, as Miranda already mentioned, is sort of the the big question that not just the library profession is, is, is looking at. I mean, the library profession, of course, is looking at diversity amongst their staff, but then also within their collection. So, um, and JMRL has like a really cool video. Um, I think it's a webinar where they talk about sort of their processes for diversifying the collection and what a collection audit looks like and that sort of thing. So um, it's a whole other side of the work. And speaking of that, JMRL also, I'll put the, um, a link in the chat. Um, they've partnered with the NAACP to offer a summer scholarship for someone um, who would be interested in librarianship um, for, for a minority student um, to see what is it like to be a library librarian. Um, as I say, come hang out with the cool kids during the day at the reference desk. <laughs> Um, let's see, I did have one final question for you guys. Um, so every now and then being at the Historical Society, visitors will come in and they remember when the Historical Society building was the public library. And one thing that always gets me is they also remember coming to the children's room, which from what they told me was down in the basement, just really hard to imagine if you've been down to the basement um, of that building. But I wanted to ask both you guys, what is your earliest memory of going to a public library? Um, I guess I'll start. Uh, my earliest memory is uh, my mom taking me to a, a library. I had some school project to do and I was gonna go to, not, I was, gonna go to the, the big library and, and look at and look at their books for some resources and just remember feeling kind of overwhelmed um, by the the rows of books and how how high they went how how long they were not knowing how to find what I was looking for but I also remember the feeling like it was a feeling like it was kind of a maze and thinking it was like a really cool place and I just wanted to get lost in there that's that's my earliest memory i think i have so i have like three separate weird memories that stand out in my brain that they're all very brief but i mean the first one of course is the very iconic getting my first library card um i so kingstown public library library card it was green it had my i kept it for a very long time i don't know if i still have it and it has like the most atrocious little kid signature on the back um with sharpie um <laughs> Other memory would be sort of this sense of like, oh, I'm an adult when you have to like drop off your book, your book in the book drop and your like parent drives you down to the book drop and you get to get out of the car while your mom is waiting in the car and you get to open the metal thing and put it in there. It felt like very bureaucratic, like something really adult. Um, and then the last memory that I have that really stands out to me and it's such a positive but weird memory is not about a public library, but about my elementary school library. I have to shout out Mrs. Woodard, who is my public <laughs> librarian. Um, she like she had these very long manicured nice nails. And so when we would have story time, she would like, I brought a book so I could do this. She would like have her nails and like click on the book and say like, we're going to read this book. And something about like that, I don't know, I guess I have these like tactile memories about the space and, and the sounds of, of that. But like, yeah, it was just memorable and it just, I remember her name and I remember her nails um, and I remember enjoying story time. Um, so that's it. <laughs> Good memories. Um, I'm gonna turn it, well, before I turn it back over to you, Tom, I'm gonna ask, does our audience have any questions? Um, if you have any, stick them in the chat. Um, Sterling, are you looking at Facebook? I am. Okay. Or just 
free to uh, unmute yourselves if you like and just ask the question. Um, I'll start off. I have one. Mm -hmm. Were the computers being introduced into JMRL in the 1980s so controversial? Because of how much they cost. And because it was a new novel technology. A lot of people thought that, you know, computers were, um, you know, some some gadget that was going to be, you know, it was going to be a fad. It would be might be popular for a while and then just go away. Uh, no one in the not many people in the 1980s realized, I think, that the world was changing as 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 much as it was. You know, okay. So Randy has asked. The children's room in the Charlottesville Public Library, do we know more about how spaces were allocated and used in that library? <laughs> um, I'm not aware of any photographs of that area of the library. And I think that's one, like I've asked people who came in, you know, well, how was this set up? You know, what did it look like? Because it's dark, it's kind of dank. Like you, you go to, you know, the public library today, and go to the children's area, it's, you know, nice big windows and lots of colors. And so it's so hard to imagine what does this look like at the bottom of the building? Um, so I think some others um, are gonna have to share like, what did it look like? I haven't come across anything um, to show what it was like down there. I think there are some photographs in um, Daily Progress. Uh, some, I've come across some articles that are like, you know, a little bit grainy Daily Progress photos. Um, but I, one interesting thing that did surprise me in the very early days of the, the McIntyre building, the first building, um, was when the building first opened, it had, you know, like a reading room, a reading um, room for children and, and women, a reading room for men, and then a reading room, room for men who smoked. So it had a separate smoking room. Right. I, I remember seeing about the smoking room in there. And the stories I like are when they about the glass floor, like suppose there was a glass floor somewhere on that like side where the stacks are on the opposite side of where the research library is. And I think some of the facilities staff think that it might still be, you know, behind the ceiling there. So in the like above the kitchen, I don't know if it was above the kitchen, just in front of where the circulation desk okay. there's that one picture of that side of the building that has the window mm -hmm. so if you could look I don't know if that allowed light into the building if that was like an architectural feature because it does seem like a very dark place sometimes yeah. the lights that are on mm -hmm. we have a comment from Lucy who says I loved going to the Richmond Public Library as a child. I could pick as many as I wanted. And I remember the smell of paste. Oh, mentioned the, the Alderman Library stacks. Oh man, you could get lost in the old stacks. Um, and there was one day I took my son in. I was, um, I dropped his sister off for something over at Curry School. And we're like, well, come with me. I'm going to show you the library and I got to pick out some books anyway. And he was just, he was probably 11 or 12 at that time. He's going to be 15 tomorrow. So it was a couple of years ago, but uh, he looked at those stacks and just, it was like mind blown for him. Um, it's kind of a shame. It's all been torn down now. Cause I think he would hang out there all day if I let him. Oh, here's a question. Addie, when did we become decide to become librarians? Um, not until my late 20s. <laughs> um, I, I mean, I've always loved books ever since my grandmother first took me to the library as a kid. Um, and I got my master's in French. That's something you and I have in common, Addie. Um, and I taught high school French and Latin for a couple of years. And then it's like, this is not for me. Um, but my aunt was a librarian, or I should say aunt by marriage it was a librarian. And she was telling me all of her adventures over her 30 years worth of being a librarian. 
I was like, this sounds really cool. Um, so I quit teaching, went to library school, and here I am. <laughs> so I am not technically a librarian because I haven't gotten an MLIS degree or MSIS degree. Um, but, and I haven't actually yet applied, although I will be sent, submitting an application, um, knock on wood. But I, so I think I decided to at least apply because um, I sort of, I guess I got into librarianship from the inside out. I started um, interning with the um, law library and I see some of my law library friends and colleagues on here. So I'm thankful for their attendance. Um, but I started interning there as a student and then uh, stayed on as a temp and then was later hired full time there and continued to, I, I initially started in the special collections department and I love, love, loved it. And then um, got moved on to work special collections and circulation. And just the more I learned, the more I realized that there's stuff I don't know and I wanna learn more and sort of wanted to have a more structured approach to learning a lot of this librarianship stuff, some of the more foundational technical things. Um, and it is, although um, there are places where um, jobs are hiring for more so experience and less so the degree, it is still for the most part a ticket to work in the libraries to have this degree, regardless of whether you've worked in the library space for a long amount of time. So while the field remains that way, it is a, a certainly useful ticket to have um to sort of advance in the field as well and a lot of public libraries now offer um tuition assistance for employees um jmrl is one who does it i know um three no two colleagues who um when when we all started they were in circulation and they're now like full-fledged librarians um one's a children's librarian and jmrl paid for part of their tuition um, for library school. So a lot of public libraries do offer that, that incentive for their employees. Any other questions? In that case then, I'm gonna turn it back over to you, Tom. Well, thank you all. This has been great. Um, much appreciated. Um, I think my take on this is that, yes, I definitely threw um, a big project at Sterling um, at the same time that he was trying to bring in volunteers to help us, you know, get back on track with COVID and everything, just throwing everything for a loop as you were all discussing, but uh, the volunteers that we have had step up, such as like with Addie and with uh, Ellen um, and the work that they've done on this article, along with the exhibit and multiple programs and multiple other partnered things with JMRL and just with Miranda and her work. I mean, I we would not be anywhere without the help of our librarians and our volunteers um, and the work that Sterling has done as a program and volunteer coordinator. So I just wanted to say thank you very much uh, for all of your effort. Um, this has been, you know, really great to see it come together. Um, didn't have a whole lot of um, folks view it live, but we're going to be putting this out on YouTube. So and uh, have a number of people that would pick up on this. And we're hoping to get Lorenzo Dickerson to do some more uh, work with us about taking some of our videos and he's always coming up with great ideas about uh, how do we promote this and the great work that we've done that you know not everyone can take a evening and and watch a program on libraries but we can turn this into a little snippet of stuff that people will look at and say wow i never knew that that's pretty cool so thank you all and uh I guess I don't see any more questions out there, but I thank everyone for attending tonight. And uh, I think that's probably about enough meandering for me, let alone meandering for all of us. Um, but before we go, we invite you to provide us any more suggestions about how we can meander on in other directions and do other things with this program. Uh, send us your ideas, comments, uh, ideas for future guests, topics, whatever you got, you're gonna leave it here and email it to programs at albemarlehistory.org. 
uh, Sterling does take into consideration every email he gets, and uh, we love to have your input. Remember to check out our website and our Facebook page uh, for our upcoming programs. Uh, remember, everything we do is your historical society is because of your support. Um, if you've not joined us as a member, please consider doing so. Uh, you can join us by uh, joining in our looking at our website um, and or calling us 434-296-1492. Any other last comments from the meandering crowd? Well, thank you. Paul, um, we are brought to you by the Albemarle Charlottesville Historical Society and wonderful supporters like you. And we are so grateful for the program and staff partnerships we have with Jefferson Madison Regional Library. And this is just one example of that. Thanks again to Miranda and for Addie and for Sterling to put you in the guest spot this evening. Uh, thanks for Zooming all of you uh, out there and Facebook living with us tonight. Um, I'm Tom Chapman. Here with Sterling Howe, Addie Patrick, and Miranda Burnett. Hope to see you for the next unregulated historical meanderings. And until then, meander on. Everyone have a great night. Good night.